Hi there, I'm Akin Grimes. And I'm Haley. I'm Jerica. Uh, and I'm Jay. And today we're going to be delving into the dungeon of your bad decisions, retrieving the treasure of wisdom. Okay, guys, so let's go into the first question, the very first question uh, that we have for you today about, uh, we got these off of RD&D's weekly question thread, where people go seeking advice on their common D&D problems, and I thought, who better to give them that, uh, that knowledge than the greatest D&D players in the world? <laughs> uh, my party. Well, thank you. <laughs> Whoa. Um, alright, so... <clears throat> I'm getting back into D&D after a couple years hiatus, and I can't for the life of me come up with a world or plot to put my players in. If anyone has a suggestion, it would be greatly appreciated. Hey guys, could you come up with, uh, everything for me? Hey guys? Yeah, this is basically the person that always wants to write a novel and has never started writing a novel in any way, like... As someone who's recently started DMing a homebrew... I think that this can be really hard. Like, it's it's a big step. Uh, but I think, like, with anything, start small. It doesn't have to be perfect the first time out. The n- ha- never having DM'd baby car- player of the group, um, I will say that you should just trust that your players will be entertained by whatever you put in front of them and just have fun with it. Yeah, if you have a solid group right off the hop, they can amuse themselves just trying to record a podcast. So if you have that kind of fundamental dynamic, you don't need to worry about, you know, what you put in front of them. They'll have fun regardless. But yeah, starting small is always a really good idea. Think of a village, uh, think of a town. Even if plot's not your thing, just give them a dungeon crawl and let them fall in love with the game in and of itself, and then the story can come in time. I remember we spent a whole session just in, like, a room, an adjacent room, and then another room. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a huge epic scale or scope, but uh, just think about what entertains you, and that likely will entertain others. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the key, I think, is uh, you don't want to over-prepare for your D&D game uh, as a new player in a new DM it can be really daunting to create this whole world and to create this whole fleshed out society and to try and come up with everything off the bat, especially if it's your first time. I think it's really important to just sort of uh, set the scope and expectation of your game. And really, just remember, uh, every encounter is about 30 minutes. Um, If you set up an encounter, you're dedicating about 30 minutes of time to that encounter. So you need to plan accordingly. Uh, If you're playing a two-hour game, you need to have about four encounters. And the other thing is, like, if you're starting with lower level players, lower level clear, well, lower level characters uh, that your players are running, um, they're not off meeting gods or royalty. They're they're rat, cat- rat catchers. You know, they're probably just dealing with mundane problems a town might have. So you don't have to have the entire like mechanisms of an entire universe in your head quite yet. You can just let them go kill some kobolds. Yeah, and uh, another good thing, though, is if you uh, go to Reddit and ask them to come up with a game for you, that's not going to work out. I I have a feeling that the game that you're going to get back is not going to be the game that you're going to want to play or the game that you're going to want to DM. It's it's just not a good idea. Uh, Reddit people are not you. You will create your own game that only you could have created, and it will be fun for that specific reason. So nobody can really give you a template. I mean, you could play a pre-made adventure if you're going to do that. You might as well just go out and buy one of the amazing adventures made by Wizards of the Coast. Uh, or go to DM's Guild and uh, buy one of their great adventures. Uh, but I think I think that pretty much answers that. I think we've helped this person. Uh, so... Uh, this next one, I think, is a very special question, and and we have to help this DM. He's in a dire situation. Uh, edition agnostic, so this doesn't apply specifically to 5th edition. All DMs could use this advice. My group is really small, just me, the DM, and usually two players. Our sessions move at a really frantic pace, to the point where I'm forgetting things in my notes, and my players are forgetting things like where they are and what they are meant to be doing. How do I slow things down? Uh, guys, guys, help! I, this campaign is rushing out of control down these tracks. I don't know what to do. We're, we're, I'm losing control. Everybody's just doing things all the time. The game's happening really fast. Help me slow down. 
So the the key that I notice in this question is two players. I I've you know I am one who sometimes frequents the the dens and low places of uh, Reddit slash R slash D and D, and I do see some some people who are looking for games. Uh, so perhaps uh, taking one of those. Uh, little orphans under your wing, or two or three of them, uh, will definitely slow down your game. Adopt a friendly adventurer. <laughs> Nothing slows down anything in life like adding more people. So that's great <laughs> advice. Yeah, absolutely. You should have a tin man party, and then your game will uh, advance at the same pace as a glacier. <laughs> I was going to say government. That might not be appropriate. <laughs> I would like to to go on on one of my uh, what will become known as Jerica's AI extravaganza rants. <laughs> I really enjoy the C team specifically because they have roles beyond class and um, race and and all those um, normal roles, and they have extra roles which actually help. The party, so they have, um, you know, your documenter and your your decisionist and your cartographer and your hordes person, and and those relate to specific tasks, and that's also something that will keep your characters occupied for um, a couple minutes up to uh, even even longer than that. Uh, just another way to to take a breather as a DM and let let some accounting or uh, map making or decisioning happen. Right. And if, you're, if your players are really going way too fast, you can always switch to Pathfinder, and that will slow things down. That sounds like Ooh, a dig at Pathfinder, digs. Jay. Do you have any other feelings about that? We just lost that Pathfinder <laughs> sponsorship. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> yeah. That sweet, sweet Pathfinder uh, money. Hey, listen, I've played Pathfinder for years. I'm heavily qualified to talk about Pathfinder. Do you, Jay, you uh, have Haley, you were uh, saying something? DM'd games both um, in person and online, is that correct? Do you find that your That's in-person correct. games or your online games go quicker, slower, any difference? Uh, I would say that an in-person game has more uh, table talk and bullshittery. Uh, I think that uh, are we allowed to one hundred challenge uh, accepted? <laughs> yeah, uh, this podcast is for adults. Uh, no, uh, I think that uh, the games online definitely tend to go a little bit faster, which seems weird, but it, it they do actually because when you're online, you're staring at a screen, you're kind of like dedicated to that function. When you're in person, you can kind of look to your phone and chill out. And you're kind of more relaxed. You're hanging out with friends. It's more casual. So it's more like a hangout. I feel like everybody's a little more serious online, which is weird, but I think it's true. No, I feel like playing in your games is a second job, and I try to treat it as such. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. Also, it's just like if you're using an online tool like World 20, it just crunches all the numbers for you, right? Like you're not sitting there being like oh, yeah, two absolutely. and six and that's eight. Probably. Have you ever tried to roll a fireball in real life? It's uh, cumbersome as hell. You mean like a Hadouken or? <laughs> no. Like, uh, you know, eight D6. Come on. That's, that's a lot of D6 to add up on the fly. And to embarrass yourself in front of your friends about your I low-level math I remember when I played an in-person D&D session and we would um we would roll our um d20 to hit and then we would also roll the damage dice at the same time just to speed everything up because every little bit helped at that point mm -hmm. but i would love to toss it to Haley and oh, see yeah. if she has any thoughts about this well if you made me do math yeah Haley, this game is too fast this game is too us. fast well, if you made me do math in my head, then I would definitely slow things down exponentially. Um, but I would say if your characters are somehow losing track of where they are and things like that, because it's going so fast, going back to what Jerica said, if you have someone who has to keep track of maps and things, and that's part of their job and they're rewarded for doing that, then that will take some time and you can kind of work that in in a way that encourages them to do a little more role-playing and less jumping from one fight to another, which sounds like that could be what's happening in your game. 
All right. I think that we have helped that person. Ayer, did you have something you wanted to say? I was just going to say having the roles is very good. And like in our game, we all have a, a, an AI role. And so I think it's really good R-O-L-E, to... R-O-L-E, not R-O-L-L, right? Right. right. We know it. Um, but so like we have Haley as our documenter and keeps incredibly detailed... Uh, incredibly detailed notes, and then Jerika is our navigatrix and keeps incredibly detailed notes. And I'm our hordes person, and my notes like contain you know such hits as "fuck that guy," <laughs> three hundred gold. <laughs> uh, but we still love you. All right. So my level five to six party says my enemies are too easy. Need advice? What should I make them fight so they will shut the hell up? There's four of them, so I can live with one or two of them dying. All right, so let's get into uh, adversarial DMing. is what I would say. (laughs) Accent on the dick. (laughs) Yeah, um, so here's the thing. If you ever start to feel like uh, the phrase, what can I do to make them shut the hell up, uh, is coming out of your mouth about your D&D party, hey, listen, there's a great subreddit called R Looking for Group, RLFG. It's where you go online and you find online players for your online game uh, or your in-person game they do in-person games as well it's a great subreddit there's more people who want to play D out there i promise you uh and dms are like just really desirable in our looking for group it's the only place in the world where that sentence is true <laughs> but dms are deeply desirable in our looking for group so if you're dm and you're starting to really feel frustrated with your players maybe it's time to move on Because your players aren't going to be happy in a game where they're being treated as enemies, and you're not going to be happy in a game where you treat your players as enemies, so you might as well find a better game. Uh, Unless that's the kind of game that you guys really dig, is like trying deeply to make each other unhappy, which has been a game I've been in before. Would you suggest um, reaching out to the players and see if any of them would be interested in DMing, or is that just going to promote the same dynamic? Uh, That's a... It's an interesting... Well, it's an interesting idea, and it may work. Uh, The problem with that is, uh, you know, obviously you're relying on the group to be very big, very mature about the whole thing, and and it can be... It really depends on the group dynamic. Uh, To answer the question specifically, though, uh, the CR system, the challenge rating system for 5th edition, is uh, useless. It's worthless. I know this because I DM for it in a lot of games. Uh, Especially if you give more than two magic items to your party. Uh, with one magical item, your party has ascended from mere mortals to uh, powerful beings. And with two magical items, they are unkillable gods who will walk this earth forever. Uh, and so you must challenge them as thus. You must create more challenging encounters than maybe the game book thinks that you should. If, especially if your players are very savvy and very smart and very capable players. Uh, so if your players are saying, hey, I'm really bored, uh, you may just want to up the challenge rating. There's a great resource called Tucker's Kobolds, which is a document online where a guy named Tucker uh, ran kobolds and made them extremely challenging because he put them in very strategic locations. He put them behind walls with arrow slits so that they couldn't easily be accessed and they could fire on the players without being able to be returned on. I do think it's a good idea. Give your enemies advantages every once in a while to give your players something to overcome. So, yeah. Anyway, that's my rant. So speaking of that, I want to pull in Haley because Haley's our ringer player and Jay <laughs> practices what he preaches because he makes sure that we shit bricks every week uh, when he's like, oh, and you're about to fight this unholy eldritch demonic creature from the past who could destroy you with a thought. And so that's the game and I'll see you uh, next week. I have to say I got some insight from from what Jay just said there about what he's doing in our game. I was going to say, yeah, like, you know, Jay saw that, you know, like, how do I make them shut up? And he was like, well, there's a DM that I can help. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, But Haley, so we had to fight a CR 10 Aboleth in the CR system. Yeah, it's not a, a perfect approximation, but like I was amazed like as like a new player you were like well I'll just use this thing that I just got so what did you do so I think that the whole environment thing is is really cool like going off of that the kobold thing that Jay was just talking about because I actually 
I don't play D and D for necessarily just beating the crap out of monsters. I like the whole kind of world and the story behind it, and so I think it's a little more interesting as a player when there's environmental things and that you have to figure out. And also, like, if they can use that to their advantage and beat something that's like a really cool monster in a unique way, um, kind of like in our game. Um, so we had to fight an abolith, which we were all really stressed out about for a whole week. And um, we, when we were trying to figure out how to get this abolith in its pool of slimy, gross water, um, I was like, oh, well, I'm a nature cleric, so I can just walk on water and make it not be in the water anymore. And if that doesn't work, at least we can go out in the water and stab it instead of having to swim and fight because that sounded really horrible to me. And um, and it worked, and we were all very excited. Um, so I think you can challenge your players with really hard monsters without setting out with the intention to kill them. Like, maybe try to change your frame of reference a little bit and say, let me let me give them something that's stressful to deal with to see how they react to it. Maybe just change your frame of reference a little bit because um, I know we see a lot of things from players complaining that their DM is just out to kill them, so that's not going to be a positive experience for every, everyone anyway, but I can also understand if, you're, if your players don't want to just kill things in a couple rounds either that you need to make things a little more difficult. Uh, and the great part about that playing with you and Bert was Bert cast suggestion on the Aboleth to let Haley cast a spell on it, convincing that, that it was going to heal the Aboleth, uh, because the Aboleth was somewhat sickly. Uh, so it was a really great combination between two players, and I really thought it was very clever, very well done. He failed the saving throw. I didn't just hand it to him on a saving, uh, silver platter. So... I play a barbarian in this game, and I, I do one thing. I smash things. And so I, I saw this sort of plan develop in our um, out-of-game chat that we have, and I caught parts of it, but um, when they... St you know, I saw the suggestion uh, as part of the plan, but when they actually delivered it in game, it was really convincing, and it was so convincing that I actually thought that they were going to try to heal uh, the Aboleth instead of hurting it. And so I was, I was very impressed by the whole situation. It was very good. Wonder Twin powers activate. Yes, absolutely. Woo. Players find. Um, what they like best. So if that role play aspect, bringing that into combat, uh, if that's what they're drawn to, they will do it. Yeah, and always yes and. If, if your players want to cast a spell, uh, you say yes and or yes but. Yes, that happens, but this also happens. Yes, that happens, and this other thing happens. Uh, that way you're encouraging that sort of creativity because if, if your players come up with a neat plan and you just shut it down, they're going to stop planning. They're just going to be like, okay, it's a bag of hit points. We got to reduce it to zero. That's all there is to it. Uh, and you don't want that because that's not D&D. &D. That's, uh, I don't know, like a old JRPG. As DMs, what things do you do to make it more fun for your players? First time DM here, drowning in information overload, was hoping I could get a couple suggestions. My players and I are going through Lost Minds of Fandelver and just finished... Cragmaw's hideout. Spoilers! Uh, however, I feel like, as a DM, I'm struggling to keep them entertained. They're into it. But you all know the moments when it's not your turn and you feel that itch to check on your fantasy league. How can I keep them constantly immersed and entertained? Thanks. I think this DM is setting a very, very high bar. I think they're under a lot of stress, and I think it's self-induced. Um, I played a... Uh, in person, um, we I played D and D in person for about two and a half years. We went through um, Rise of Tiamat and that whole thing, and we would check our phones. Like we might we might need it to take a mental break. Maybe something really crazy just happened, and we needed five minutes. Um, so I think that keeping your players engaged for the whole time. It can be hours and hours and hours. I think that is a very high bar to set for yourself. Yeah. I, oh, absolutely. I heard a really cool... I was listening to one of the Dragon Talk podcasts the other day, and they were talking about 
like setting scheduled breaks and letting people know ahead of time, like when they're going to be like, Hey, we've got a break coming up in 15 minutes. And maybe like letting people know that they're going to have a break in like 10, 15 minutes and maybe they'll hold off on their phones. And and there was a suggestion in there and I'm sorry, I cannot remember who was speaking, but it was something like planning a five, a few minute break per every, like, I think it was every hour for games that go longer than an hour, hour and a half. And so that might help, like, cut down on that, oh, my players are looking at their phones, they're not having a good time stress. Like, people are probably getting those, the texts are blowing up on the phone and they want to see what's happening, and and that's fine. Yeah, that was, that was Jeremy Crawford, I think he was talking about, like, that was a... Uh... Uh, um, sage advice was kind of like like dm table etiquette and he was saying yeah that was a really good tip like you know he'll run lawn sessions and uh just you know let making sure that you include bio breaks because we're all animals it turns out and uh etc so yeah that was a really good one he's always sage advice is i will listen to the dragon talk podcast just for rules clarifications because i am that pedantic yeah, I've gotten really into sage advice and lore you should know. Yeah. Um, I would say that as somebody who's run really, really long sessions and someone who's run kind of shorter sessions, I'm actually, the game I'm running for these people is two two hours, which is probably the shortest D&D game I've ever run. Uh, I typically go for two and a half hours. I think two and a half hours is the sweet spot. Three hours is uh, okay as well. I think anything over three hours can be excessive if you do it too often. Because you did that when you're kids, you did that when you're teenagers, and it was fun. But I I really do think that games that go on that long can be really draining and daunting and, and exhausting. And frankly, they can't po- you can't possibly plan for 12 hours of content when your players go off the rails in the first hour. I really think setting a good time limit for your game, letting everybody have a clear expectation of how long the game's going to go, that's great advice. Setting a clear break point in the middle, that's great advice. And then other than that, if you're still having a lot of trouble keeping people's attention and it's really becoming a problem at the table, like you're noticing there's a lot of distractedness, communicate with your players. Ask them what's going on. Ask them why they're checking out so much. Ask them what's happening, what the problem is. Because it may be that your encounters aren't challenging enough, like the question before, and they're getting a little bored. Uh, You may want to up the difficulty a bit because your players may be a little more savvy than you're giving them credit for. Um, and it may just be that they're bored because they're not involved in the plot very much, or they're not involved in the role play very much, in which case you may want to give them like a little highlight session to get a little more involved with the party and, and figure out what it is about their character that they really like, so you can lean into that a little more. Or maybe they're overwhelmed, or maybe there's things happening outside of game, outside of their immediate environment that are happening as well, and I think... Jay brings up a really good point that communication is really, really important because it could be one of many, many, many things. And Air had a comment. Tell me. Oh, I was just going to say there's also that it was exactly like you were saying that the self-inflicted DM guilt that I'm not entertaining my players or they're not in completely engrossed in my worlds. Like it, it's a lot of the times like you're reading body language and as mammals, we're just terrible at it. Like, uh, my favorite example is actually Ryan Hartman on the C team because when he is not actively role playing or actively involved in combat, it looks, at least from my thing, like he is bored as hell, but he's not. As soon as they call him in to do something, lickety split, he's there, RPing, he's in the moment. So he's actually pe- playing, paying huge attention to what's being said and what's going on. That's just how he does it. You know, we all kind of have our own mannerisms and 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 ways of doing things so like i almost like it's kind of like the the blind taste Mm -hmm. test i would almost recommend this dm play online where they can't see what their players are doing in between the moment and see if you still feel that way because as long as you know when their turnaround comes around in combat or in an rp situation uh you know someone turns to them and asks them a question and they pipe up and they don't miss a beat then they were they were involved and they were engaged if they can split their attention if they can check their phone i mean they might just be looking up a spell they want to cast or uh or maybe this is a famous npc they're talking to and they want a little dirt on them because they got a really good insight check and they're not metagaming um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> etc cetera, etc cetera. I, I just think... like Bert to think of something like that I don't what are your accusations are are cruel and untrue <laughs> so yeah 
say that to my face. <laughs> I absolutely, I absolutely agree with what you guys are saying. I think you had a very good answer to this question. Yeah, I think that the best advice that I was ever given for life in general is to ask for feedback and learn how to receive feedback. And it's a perfect time to kind of practice that. You mean, Haley, you mean being mature? You mean growing (laughs) up? I'm struggling with the adult thing, but I am working on this. Um, I I teach, and so I tend to – I've started um, asking people at the beginning of lessons, like, I really like some feedback. I want to make sure that everyone's getting as much as they can out of this. So uh, please feel free to – come and talk to me like maybe you're taking a break in your game like come tell me what you think of games and I like and I always tell people that if they give me feedback I promise to thank them for it because it's really hard to give feedback to a friend um so you like they probably love your game and they love your story but maybe there's like one thing that they wish they could tell you but they don't want to be like hey I don't like it when you do this because they're afraid that you will be upset so just... Oh, there's a. I have a great example of that. Uh, I had a. I had a whole campaign where I was playing with these gentlemen and gentle ladies, and we were having this great adventure. And then I got pretty far in, and it was getting kind of weird. The people were kind of disengaging. They were getting. They were. They were not responding as well as they used to. And I was. I was asking them like. What is it that's losing you in this campaign? And I, I, I swear, I know that I don't do this anymore. I probably have overcorrected and do it too little. But I swear the complaint I got was, whenever we go into a new town, we all kind of know we can check out for a minute because you're going to spend 15 minutes describing <laughs> the new place. And it's really exhausting. How Rococo is the architecture. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. There's, there's, there's that line between, like, I want to build a rich world versus, like, now I'm just, you know, J.R.R. Martining it. And here's here's how amber every doublet is. Like, it gets mm-hmm. a little, yeah. It but can... there is also something in that if you have a really good DM, they're mm-hmm. able to pick out what is the most important to the players. And so they can spend some time... I, I uh, remember the um, the moment in the AI podcast that was released recently before PAX West, um, where Chris Perkins and the team and Strix uh, went into what 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 Congo Tamu's uh, palace, and you know Chris was talking about all the murals and paintings and wonderful art, but he zeroed in and also also Mike. Mike K did this too, where he asked, "Oh, is there a picture of Jim in here?" <laughs> and and so that's what that's what hooked Jim. He wanted himself, um, <laughs> and so you know, and then and then Chris ran with that. So he they had this little communication of what's important to the players, and they worked it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Chris, I think, has a pretty good beat on what his players want now. Jim wants his ego stroked. Viari wants unnecessary favoritism. Chandeliers. Omen wants new words. Yeah, chandeliers, absolutely. Omen wants new words. And Strix wanted a dinosaur covered in shit. So (laughs) it all worked out. I think uh, going to the opposite end of that spectrum, I think uh, Matt Mercer is the one who leans more towards the the long, rosy descriptions of places and really getting mm-hmm. deep into the description of a new location. Uh, he does those really drawn out, kind of more in-depth descriptions of the locales. And that works for his players because his players are very role-play heavy and they're super into character and they need to be able to visualize his stuff to be able to play correctly. Cause, and um, that's a different communication style too. Mm-hmm. So he's giving the players all these little hooks and not necessarily serving for them, but... Yeah you know, letting them see all the possibilities. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and in my style is just breeze right past. <laughs> the cities don't matter. The adventure's out in the world. <laughs> um, maybe I've overcorrected. Uh, all right. I think we've answered this one. Uh, we'll do one last one, one funny one, and then we'll be done. Uh, okay. I think, I think this, this funny one is, is good. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> My party wants to hire two orphan kids, <laughs> one gold piece per day. That's actually a pretty good salary for orphan kids uh, that are capable of writing. They want to hire them so they can take notes of every conversation they have. Basically, they want two NPCs to take notes for them. The question is, how do I handle this? Should I kill them eventually? How would this play out? 
<laughs> Can I just say I like how open ended the question "Should I kill them eventually?" is. Is that is the, it players? the players? Is, is it, it the orphans? orphans? <laughs> is it all of the above? Did they just circle C? Like it's it's just great that he, they didn't think to specify at all. Uh, but more so, yeah, when your players are forcibly trying to give you homework, maybe they need a little course correction. <laughs> like, I think it's so funny that he does not take offense at all. Like the, the, the point of the question is never like, oh, I don't want to take notes for my players. I don't think I should be taking notes for my players. It's very much like, how do I enable my players to not have to take notes? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, um, it's pretty... I guess- there's a lot of ingenuity from your players there. I mean, yeah. you you could you've got some clever people, but maybe put that cleverness to uh, use working out some some uh, puzzles yeah. or something instead. <laughs> I absolutely, I love that they were trying to like make it like a matter of charity. It's like, how can we lift these? How can we employ these poor yeah. orphan children? Wow. Like, if you don't let us do this, aren't you really the monster DM? <laughs> like, the the guilt trip there was palpable. Like, they they really they knew how to get the hooks in deep. I do think that there is some real good uh, meat in this situation. I think you can learn a lot about the past of these orphan children. Uh, maybe they don't write so well, or maybe every third word is uh, meat pie or something. Um, and, and maybe a uh, older brother or sister will come along and snatch them away at some point. Oh, I don't I, think ooh. that mm-hmm. the mechanic of another character whether it be a pc or an npc should write your notes for you um so i think the dm should take this opportunity to uh you know make these players lives better by messing with their orphan children i think uh yeah you've, you've created an interesting point here you brought to the surface an interesting point which is you can have uh the trope of the unreliable narrator you can have these kids take notes that are wrong and then the players, who are obviously not taking notes themselves, may not notice right away that these notes are wrong. And they may get The misled. orphan children aren't invested in the story, yeah. and right. maybe the PCs aren't either, but if they are, they're going to want their notes taken properly. Yeah. Right. And more importantly, like, yeah, if, if, great- you, if you, you, in, you introduce a situation with an, uh, a narrator that's unreliable, you can have something like, Maybe the local lord who hates your players uh, pays these kids off to write bad notes, to send them in wrong directions, to send them to wrong NPCs. Little birds. Yeah, exactly. Uh, And suddenly now your note-taking NPCs have become a liability that have guided you off track dramatically and led you into a trap. You have a real opportunity here. The great comic relief thing when they finally get the notes and it's like the adventure sword man yelled at me again today. <laughs> the singing lady was nice. She gave me a crumpet. Like, you know, and yeah, like that's exactly. it. That's I the entire that. week's that's long. That's great feedback. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, or the kids can start making up like slotting things in and the kids have their own story that they make the adventures kind of like through the notes they you could do some cool storying there. Um, yeah. they slip things in and make the adventurers go and do some task that they came up with themselves. Like, be pretty cool. Yeah, but here's the the main thing that I would say if you're really having a problem with your players, uh, keeping in mind, I always do a recap of the last session at the beginning of every new session. I think it, I think it's really important to do a recap at the beginning of every session because people do forget stuff and not only that but if you make your players do a recap of important events then you're going to see what they thought was important and you're going to see what they thought was relevant to remember if you do a recap then you can purposely put for put that you can purposely put forward information that you know to be vital or important that the player should remember so there's there's you know pros and cons to doing it both ways but I do think doing a recap at the beginning of every session is important. And when you use online tools like Roll20, just be diligent about adding NPC handouts, NPC folders, create characters for people. Uh, short one-line descriptions of the NPCs are going to help your players so much to remember who all these people are. Yeah, I'm terrible with names, like in real life and in game. And so having just a little... Like, I'll remember a description of a person before I remember their name. So having those... Can we all... Can we all just recall in our mind's eye Captain Shale and his wonderful mat of of hairiness? Yeah, like, exactly. Oh, the descriptions, they don't have to be long, but they can be meaty. 
Exactly. Because yeah, in our campaign, we're on a boat, and I mispronounced the captain's name at least three times. And I think I started to try playing it off as like an RP thing. Like my haughty ass bard was just like, "Right, right, you're the little people, you know. I I'll get your name right eventually. Don't, don't, don't wait for it in an acceptance speech at any point." Like, but uh, yeah, I am terrible with names as well. So having handouts that I can refer back to, I refer back to our handouts constantly and i listen very intently when jay says the opening lines to every great D, D adventure pause 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 when last we left our heroes there we go that's what i like that's what i crave up on thank you sir i would say the other I, thing i'm glad that you appreciate it the 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 <laughs> the other thing that um i know we keep talking about these roles and responsibilities that you can give your players but i think that that also incur i wouldn't necessarily take notes probably as well if i weren't our party's documenter and if i did not get advantage because i take them each week <laughs> so i get a little added bonus so maybe you can find some way to besides them knowing the story but some material way to incentivize your players to not just oh, pay expand an orphan. upon that because they, they probably don't understand fully what you're talking oh yes about, so but... if you have not watched the c team um and you do not know what i'm talking about so in the c team there are some acquisitions incorporated franchise roles and one of them is Documenter, and that person is responsible for reporting on the party's adventures back to the corporate headquarters. And so I am the documenter in our party, and so it's my responsibility to write up what we did in our adventure each week. And if I have done that in our next game session, I get a free advantage to use when I so choose. So um, I am incentivized yeah, to I take notes. Yeah, and I gave basically all the players a way to farm uh, DM inspiration uh, through their roles because I think it's uh, I think it's first of all a good way to give out DM inspiration that's more natural than just trying yes. to find a than just trying to find a hot moment in the game that you really like because uh, that can be several sessions before somebody gets something. Um, and it's it's nice to have that inspiration, especially if you're going to be like me and give a more difficult campaign than some other DMs. Uh, you're going to want to give out that inspiration so they can have uh, some special power to use in a clutch. Uh, some special thing that they can fall back on and that can be DM inspiration. Um, but yeah, so I think the decisionist, the person who makes the decisions in our party, can give out a token to people he outvotes that gives them DM inspiration. Um, our... Um, and it has it, it hasn't broken the game in any significant way. Trust me, they're still fully challenged, if you can tell from this uh, conversation. I forget that I have it a lot of the time, but it's nice if I have it in a pinch. The late night post game weeping has dropped off considerably, <laughs> um, but we haven't fought anything too big. You've basically put an army before us now, so that's gonna go great. Ah, oh, well, you you haven't seen the start of it, but that's for next time. Um, yeah, I, I think that, I think that we've thoroughly answered that question. Uh, the note taking is an important part of the game, uh, but an unreliable narrator may not be who you want to take your notes. And for you Indeed. players, for your play, you players, your DM already does a lot of great work for you. So don't try to give your DM extra work to do because you want them to come up with great adventure for you, not be really busy writing up notes for you. And it's not just... just about guilt, it's also about revenge. Your DM will <laughs> find a way to make whatever advantage they were forced to give you into a disadvantage somehow. Oh, I just want to see the zero sum game. I'm like, can you roll my dice? They're so heavy. Like, yeah. I want to see hire, the that Can player. I hire NPCs to go on this adventure for us? Uh, can I hire NPCs to actually just do these quests that we're supposed to be doing? You just run a uh, corporation. Can we just stay at home the entire time. Actually, our characters want to pick up a game of D and D because they hired all their jobs out to NPCs. So can we have D &D an inception? Yeah. Can we have an in D and D game of D and D so we can actually have something to do again? <laughs> Uh, it sounds like your players have too much money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. You could make them poor. Too comfortable. There, uh, there are there are rust monsters that eat metals. Uh, surely there can be one for gold, right? I can see from here you have too much money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that's going to be it for Insight Check this week. This was Insight Check. <laughs>
Oh, right. You have to push the button that makes it stop. 